Hey guys, what's going on? It's Alexander Williamson here on the Aquatic Morning Show, and I am wishing you a very happy Monday. Uh, today I want to talk about a really cool project. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to do with the fish we keep, or really fish at all, uh, kind of. So what it has to do with are the first lizards that swam back into the water. And I know a lot of you might also be interested in whether it's monitor lizards or snakes or whatever it may be, alligators, crocodiles. Uh, and this is related to that group. This is the uh, ichthyosaurus or the fish lizards that ruled the oceans from mm, like 350 million years ago. Uh, to around 250 million years ago. And there are some remnants of uh, similar uh, evolutionary uh, buddies around, but recently a university called Lund University tracked the research that's been done ever on all ichthyosaurs, and they were able to map 300 years since, since uh, the late 1700s of all the research that's ever been done into fossils and into ichthyosaurs and their evolution and how they basically came from fish that got onto land that then went back into the sea as reptiles and decided to eat fish and turtles and alligators and, you know, they were ginormous. Uh, so those of you that are dinosaur fans or fish fans or lizard fans, I thought this one might be kind of cool. And uh, Lund University, if you look it up, they have a program on the ichthyosaur. So you could look up ichthyosaur, just like ichthyology is spelled, the uh, study of fish. And uh, they have a interactive reconstruction and a timeline of all the research that's been done and all the accomplishments of them figuring out what in the heck these things were and, you know, how they thought they were like monsters and mythical dragons originally, and then it turns into Darwinism and it, the fossil hunts and all those sort of things. And then now how we've actually found fossils of them with pigment and with fat cells and protein and muscle that is visible in the fossil layers, which is really crazy. I mean, not many species of any animal does that exist. And now we're starting to see some of that and uh, be able to tell some of that, especially by slowly removing layers of uh, different minerals and things that the fossils are found in. Whereas before they were carved out for the hard structures, but those soft structures couldn't be mapped like graphite or whatever, where the carbon had turned into just dust or kind of a charcoal consistency. But now you can go to that website uh, from Lund University and you can also check out the fully reconstructed uh, body of all the fossilized ichthyosaurs that ever existed. So I thought that was kind of a cool little fish adjacent thing and maybe an interesting way to start off your Monday if you haven't checked it out before. All right, guys, this has been Alex with The Secret History Living in Your Aquarium. I'll talk to you later. Bye, guys, Bye, guys. and I'll talk to you. I guess that's my cue. <laughs> Bye, guys. Hey guys, it's me again, Alexander Williamson from The Secret History, Living in Your Aquarium channel. And uh, as we started the week on a uh, fish-adjacent tangent, I thought I'd continue that. So this article that I was reading also has some news about fish, but it has news most importantly for the study that was going on. Uh, it was from the Woods Hole Institute, Oceanographic Institute in Massachusetts. And they did a bunch of research by putting microphones all over the oceans around the world. And then they actually tracked uh, sea turtles. And they put microphones on the sea turtles to see how much noise they were exposed to over like a year or two. And then they took that data and fed it into a uh, algorithm and a, a graphing um, program. And it turned out that, you know, usually they weren't exposed to a ton of noise but that they were when they were swimming around like shipping lanes or even just near coastal towns and cities, like if they're near Miami, Florida or something, um, even like 40 miles away, the, the noise from underwater oil rigs, um, the noise from naval vessels, submarines, uh, the sonar, all that stuff adds up. Different animals hear in different frequencies. We've known for a long time that... Uh, 
whales and dolphins really are messed up by sonar and other um, communications uh, wavelengths that we use for military and civilian purposes. Um, they make noises to chart their underwater world and to get feedback on the world around them as well as to communicate. And a lot of times they go the wrong way or they beach themselves and it's not known whether this is the direct cause, but now we have information because we were able to go out and gather those. That was weird. Uh, there were some eyes behind me that I could see reflecting. Uh, I think it was a cat. Uh, in any case, so <laughs> we were able to go out and collect uh, those turtles and the microphones and then we were able to look in their inner ears. and we were able to um, see how old they were and other things by um, collecting the, there's a little bone in there, an autolith, it's, uh, or, or basically a stone, they, you know, a stone, uh, that's where the word lith comes from, uh, in the ear, and it puts rings around it, and it's in fish, it's in a, a lot of creatures, we have a hammer in our eardrum, and it's kind of similar to that, uh, but a lot of marine animals have this autolith, and they can tell how old they are, how their diet was that year, uh, by each of the layers, like tree rings. And so they were able to compile a bunch of data from that. And then finally, once they had proven that they'd been exposed to all this sound over time, they were able to take the ones um, that were still alive, that they'd been tracking, that they didn't just collect the bodies of and so forth, uh, and they were able to put them in an aquarium and test them against newborn turtles and turtles that had been raised in really remote places like the Pacific Islands and see how their hearing was. And it turns out their hearing was awful. So the damage done to their hearing occurred at a much, much, much lower rate uh, of sound intensity than humans need for damage and some of it occurred at ranges that we can't even hear so it really is causing us to rethink how uh, fish and how um, reptiles and amphibians and other creatures mammals in the ocean uh, are being impacted by human activity not just in all the ways we know are uh, invasive and uh, disruptive to them but in the ways uh, we haven't thought of or in the ways that work for their perception so you know they use echolocation or they have lateral lines for sensing um you know vibrations in the water so what happens when an oil rig is pounding down uh pile drivers or pipe for you know a year straight in the area where there's fish or turtles you know um it throws off that vibration sensor. It, it, it's deafening or it's so much noise that it dulls their ability to differentiate little sounds and pressure waves out of that. So they're just beginning work on this, but it's, it's pretty interesting and it seems like it could explain some of the uh, really odd things that we see sometimes when you see like a whole school of dolphins just going off track, you know. So now we have something new to look for when you see all those beach dolphins. I mean, now now we have something to kind of maybe see if the ones that we can rescue, if, if they're suffering from that hearing loss. And if so, then we know that they've been exposed to that long-term, uh, repetitive, uh, low-grade noise. And um, just because it doesn't deafen us or cause hearing damage to humans, we kind of put it out of sight, out of mind for animals. And I guess that was a bit arrogant, maybe. Um, because, you know, every creature per perceives the world differently. So just some food for thought, and uh, that's all I've got for you guys today. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one, guys. Bye. Hey, guys, it's Alexander Williamson here with Fishery, the morning news segment of what's new in the academic world of fish science and uh, the hobby. So... This morning, I was reading a really interesting article, and it was in actually a medical journal, but it was taken from a, a, a post and worked on by a team. So originally, the first article that the team was using and looking at that sparked their research was from um, uh, Connecticut, a university in Connecticut. And then uh, the, the research was on cystic fibrosis, and uh, cystic liver uh, deterioration. 
which is basically when your immune system attacks connective tissue and, and starts, um, or organs, and starts destroying it because it thinks that there is an invader, basically. So then there was a study done at the University of Minnesota, and they went into Canada, and they studied three spine stickleback fish. And they were looking at these remote lakes uh, in Canada. And there are some lakes that were formed not due to glaciation and which filled with water and have flooded over and things that share genetic um, similarities, but rather they are very isolated and they are uh, caused by a meteor impact. So there was this big lake, and you can find it on Google Maps. Uh, <laughs> it looks like a meteor impact. Uh, so it's kind of interesting, but um, kind of uh, a little bit to the left, I believe, of the Great Lakes and north um, in Canada. And then there's all these teeny little lakes around it from where the debris fell back down to earth. And the main lake is a big lake. Uh, it's like the size of Salt Lake or something almost. But the lakes that far inland, they have fish in them. And it's not just trout and freshwater fish that you find along riverways and things. It's actually three-spined sticklebacks, which here in Seattle, they swim in from the, the salt water and, and brackish water. And then they can survive in the freshwater too. But the cool thing about sticklebacks and sunfish and a lot of fish like that is that they can be carried or their eggs can be carried on the, on the wings of birds, on their feathers, on their feet and even in their stomachs. So a new article also was just talking about how ducks uh, and other waterfowl generally don't have a stomach designed to break down high protein like an egg. They have um, stomachs designed to break down plants and things, uh, which is interesting because I've seen ducks eat a lot of slugs and stuff like that. Um, but apparently uh, they break it down over time and uh, not necessarily with the corrosive environment that would break down an egg. So there you go. A little more trivia for you. But they looked at these fish in these remote lakes that were genetically, uh, they've been apart since the ice age broke up. So they had glace, glaciers over them. And then basically, as soon as that ended, it looks like there's enough generations by looking at their matrilineal DNA, that we can tell that they've been in those lakes for eight, 9,000 years at least, and that nothing has come and added to their population. So it's probably when the sea was much closer to those lakes, uh, the brackish waters and rivers where they lived, they were able to get picked up by birds and dropped off in the lakes. Well, that gives them a really unique genetic identity because they aren't related um, like in a familial way to any other sticklebacks nearby. And here in the Northwest, we have sticklebacks that are bright blue and green and some that are orange and like kind of a um, orange and yellow color put together. And then we have some that are silver and we have some that are armored, some that aren't, some that have huge spines, like an inch long and others that have less than a millimeter uh, spine. So they vary a lot and you can really tell just by looking at them. Well, it turns out that they're really susceptible to tapeworm parasites that get into fish. And it turns out also that we've known for a while that fish have a way to fight off parasites uh, like flesh burrowing worms and nematodes. And that is that they create this um, temporary connective tissue that looks kind of like a sponge under the microscope. So instead of looking like muscle or, um, or uh, tendons or anything like that, it looks like, um, like a Brillo pad or a sponge under a microscope. And it's kind of this connective sinewy stuff that patches the area until the, uh, the right tissue can grow back, even if it's gone into organs. So now we're finding that there is a gene associated with that. And so they're realizing that some of these sticklebacks in these remote areas were most resistant to those tapeworms because of the fact that, you know, they're the only ones that survive were the ones that could resist. And so they've evolved this mechanism. And now we're looking at ways in which we can trigger that same gene or um, at least biological response of proteins to patch humans. So we may in the end, thanks to a meteor, 
<laughs> that hit in Canada and made lakes. And then these little fish got dropped off by either like a tornado or a hurricane that dropped them off or by birds, by ducks, who knows, you know, raining frogs kind of thing. Uh, and now we may have the start to a cure for cystic fibrosis and other connective tissue disorders. So it's just another reminder that everywhere we look, even species that are really common, like sticklebacks, um, we can learn something really amazing from them sometimes. And a lot of times it has a direct impact on humans and on the progress of humanity. And that's why it's so important to preserve nature and, and you know, to leave it there. Because if they go extinct, it doesn't need to be some exotic, amazing, you know, frog with 40 colors and, you know, cool patterns. It could be the most boring looking ant ever, but it could hold the secret to, you know, curing cancer. We don't know. So, um, just something to think about guys, but I will talk to you later and uh, I hope you have a great morning. Uh, I'll talk to you later, Jess. Bye. Hey guys, what's going on? It's Alexander Williamson here with the fishery living in your aquarium. So, you know, you can check out more content over on my channel, but for members and for the Aquatic Morning Show, you guys get to hear weekly stories every day about cool research going on in the fish world. And in this case, it is a really cool project that right now might be uh, really pointless, but I still think it's cool. And it's called fishsounds.net. And what it is, is it's a database that the University of Florida and Florida State University, so they have a place called the um, Aquaculture Research Lab, and it does really cool work. They're the first ones to breed the Pacific Blue Tang and the Yellow Tang and the Firefish um, and some races and things that are saltwater fish that have never been bred in captivity. They're the ones who figure out uh, ilio iliobiopsidae and how to solve that in, in freshwater shrimp. So anything that's in our hobby or in our food uh, consumption of fish or aquaculture they work on and then basically they're subsidized by the state of Florida because then they re relay that information to farmers that are uh, raising fish or importers that are raising fish and uh, selling them so it helps the economy basically that's the thought behind it but along with that we have philanthropists that are helping out and uh, a woman named uh, Kieran Cox uh, is behind this uh, project, funding the server space and so forth, and uh, getting people together. But basically, it's a database of all the sounds we know that fish make. And until very recently, everyone just assumed that fish didn't really communicate. Like, maybe they made sounds. Like, we knew there were squeaking catfish and toadfish that make different noises and croaking garamis. But we didn't really know what that was about and a lot of people wrote it off just like a lot of people said fish don't feel pain or other things like that um until we found the same nerve tissue that humans have um and we just write it off but now we're finding that like with mormorids for instance like the elephant nose fish or the ghost knife fish they could communicate with electrical signals and noises and they can communicate through muddy water this way and most of the, the fish that we can hear making noises are actually catfish or garamis or anabantoids that live in kind of murky, muddy waters or really tannic waters that have low visibility. And so they're doing this clearly to communicate to their fellow fish. Uh, and some of them make noise by filling their air bladder. Some of them can actually fart bubbles. Some of them can um, rub their... Uh, pectoral fins against a little piece of cartilage and it makes a clicking or creaking sound. Others can uh, click their mouth together like parrotfish in their beaks and uh, others grind their jaw. I mean there's so many ways that have evolved that these fish make noises but nobody had ever really put them in one spot. Well now there's a spot and it's called fishnoises.net and, or fishsounds.net? What did I say at the beginning? Whatever I said at the beginning. Uh, I'll put it in the info uh, below for the members. But it's um, interesting because now they're going to start opening it and putting like pins on a map of where the species are. And 
if there's any information on what they're conveying. Because like with mormorids, we know now that there's one noise they make and all the mormorids around go silent. And then that same mormorid that made that one pitch frequency that's identifiable will then say something else. And so it's either communicating food or danger or mating season stuff or who knows what. But they know that they make over 30 different impulses when they're communicating electronically. And same goes for sound with catfish. There's some fish that can make over 100 different sounds. So you've got those active sounds, and then you've also got what we call incidental sounds. So when a fish hits the top of the water and it makes a splash, or when its tail flicks, or uh, when you get one of those... Uh, I don't know if you guys can hear that, but, you know, the water drop noise. <laughs> so, uh, Ferris Bueller reference, if anybody's uh, not getting it. Anyhow, so, uh, yeah, it's kind of a cool little project, and uh, I thought some of you might be just nerdy enough to check it out, maybe even to get a, a aquatic microphone and see if your fish are talking in your aquarium and submit your own data. So, uh, yeah, check it out. All right, guys. Well, I'll talk to you later. Have a great weekend and uh, have a good one. Talk to you later, Jess. Uh, take it from here.